Well, good morning again, everybody. On this uh, blessed All Saints Sunday, I welcome you to Asbury United Methodist Church. My name is Chris Jones. If I haven't met you before, I serve this congregation as one of the pastors. I also want to welcome uh, those of you who are worshiping with us right now on the internet. Uh, we are live streaming the service on Facebook and YouTube, and do encourage those of you online to please take a moment to like the video, to subscribe to our page, and also the comment, in, uh, the comment section, and let us know that you're with us today. Uh, let's go to God in prayer. God, thank you for all the saints whom you have blessed us with, who have taught us what it means to be a follower of you, and who now rest from their labors. And we look forward to the day in which we'll join them again as we sing your praises and we sing your glory for all eternity. Uh, this time in our service, we're about to open up scripture and uh, seek to hear a word from you. So God, I pray that you would use me as a preacher and if necessary, speak in spite of me. May all of us today discover your truth and may that truth change us from the inside out. We ask all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Well, if I were to ask you, what sort of qualities make up the perfect pastor? How would you answer that question? Besides, of course, by listing all the qualities that Pastor Will has. <laughs> but if I were to ask you what sort of qualities make up the perfect pastor, how would you answer that question? Before you answer it, let me share with you how some people responded. Evidently, a while back, some church people got together. It's always a risky thing when church people get together. But some church people got together, and they came up with a description of the perfect pastor. And so listen carefully to what I'm about to share and see if your clergy team at Asbury measures up. The perfect pastor preaches exactly 10 minutes. <laughs> I'm already in trouble, aren't I? The perfect pastor condemns sin roundly, but never hurts anyone's feelings. The perfect pastor works from 8 a.m. until midnight and is also the church custodian. The perfect pastor makes $400 a week, wears good clothes, drives a good car, buys good books, and donates $500 a week to the church. <laughs> the perfect pastor is 29 years old and has 40 years of experience. The perfect pastor never forgets a name and spends most of their time praying. Above all, the perfect pastor is attractive. Amen? Nobody said amen. Come on. <laughs> the perfect pastor also knows when somebody is sick and needs a hospital visit, even without anyone telling the perfect pastor that somebody is sick and needs a hospital visit. The perfect pastor always smiles and tells you what you want to hear. The perfect pastor also goes out to eat after service with each individual family, spreading their time evenly between all, and he or she also pays for all their meals. <laughs> the perfect pastor has a burning desire to work with the youth and spends most of their time with the senior citizens. The perfect pastor makes 15, 15 home visits a day and is always available in the office for people to randomly stop by whenever they want. The perfect pastor meets with all the other pastors in town because they all have so much time in their hands. The perfect pastor also stays focused on the vision of the church, and the perfect pastor attends all the town and community meetings for PR's sake. Now here it is. This is the important part. The perfect pastor is always in the next church over. Now if your pastor does not measure up, simply send this notice to six other churches that are tired of their pastor. Then bundle up your pastor and send them to the church at the top of the list. If everyone cooperates... In one week's time, you will receive 1,643 pastors. One of those pastors is bound to be perfect. <laughs> Have faith in this letter. One church broke the chain and got its old pastor back in less than three months. And who on earth would want that? So what do you think? Yeah, thank you, thank you. Well, I'll be the first to admit that this church does not have the perfect pastor. Uh, not in Pastor Will, uh, not in Pastor Barber, and certainly, definitely not in myself. In fact, the truth is, you'll never find the perfect pastor, no matter what church you're a part of, because the perfect pastor does not exist. It's a made-up concept. There's no such thing as the perfect pastor. And I wonder if the reason we so often jump around different churches 
looking for the perfect pastor, is we don't have a proper understanding of what a pastor's job really is. What is a pastor's job? Well, the Apostle Paul actually clarifies this for us in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. So listen carefully to what Paul writes here in this text. Now, these are the gifts, Paul says, that Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to do what? Equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Let's read that last part once more. Equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. So there we have it. If a pastor is doing their job well, then that pastor, through their preaching and their teaching and their spiritual leadership and their vision casting, is equipping God's people, that would be all of you, equipping God's people to do his work in the world. Because the reality is, all of us have a part to play. All of us have a part to play in doing God's work. No exceptions. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how young you are. It doesn't matter what your educational background is. It doesn't matter what your income level is. It doesn't matter if you're working, if you're retired. By the way, there is no retirement when it comes to God. All of us have a part to play in doing God's work. No exceptions. Scripture makes this point abundantly clear, crystal clear. And there are few places in Scripture that make this point clearer than 1 Corinthians 12. And 1 Corinthians 12 is the text that I really want us to focus on this morning. And so check out with me what Paul, Paul is the same person who wrote Ephesians. Paul wrote this text as well. Well, listen with me to what Paul says here, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 6, 12 through 14, and verse 27. So we're going to be jumping around a little bit in this chapter. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. Paul here is talking about the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, the Godhead. There are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them and everyone. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. Now you, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. This is the word of God for the people of God to which we all say, thanks be to God. What the Apostle Paul is doing in this passage in a very systematic way is he's offering to us, he's giving to us, presenting to us his understanding of the church. Um, scholars call this ecclesiology. Ecclesiology basically means the study of the church. It comes from the Greek word ekklesia, uh, which means called out community uh, or church. So Paul is offering to us his understanding of the church, how the church functions, how the church operates, how the church is supposed to work. And so in doing this, and Paul is a great writer, he's very persuasive, he wants to make his point come across. In doing this, Paul likens the church to what? What does he compare the church to? A human body. Just like the human body has many different parts, while in a similar sense, the church, and what is the church? The church is the body of Jesus. We talked about this last week, that the body of Jesus is Paul's preferred metaphor for the church. It's the metaphor that he uses more than any other metaphor in the New Testament. Well, just like the human body has many different parts, the church, the body of Jesus, has many different parts. In each of us, as a follower of Jesus, we are a part of the body. And so when all of us as followers of Jesus are doing what we're meant to be doing, then the church is healthy. Then the church is thriving. Then the church is functioning as God wants it to function with every single person contributing. And so this morning, as we continue our journey through our new sermon series, uh, we started the series last week called All of Who We Are, in which we're talking about what it means to give not some of who we are over to Jesus through the church, but all of who we are, our entire being, and in which we're talking about the four T's, the letter T, the four T's of discipleship. What are the four T's of discipleship that we mentioned last time? Time, talent, treasure, 
trust, time, talent, treasure, trust. Well, today, we're going to talk about that second T, talent. That if the church is going to be thriving, if we're going to be living as followers of Jesus who walk in the way that leads to life, we're going to give the church our talent. Now, when it comes to talent, what we're talking about this morning, what we're focusing on in this message, we can break talent up into two different categories. The first category is natural abilities. And then the second category is spiritual gifts. Let's talk about that first category for a few moments. Natural abilities. There are some things that all of us here today, all of us worshiping online, there are some things that we all naturally do well, right? Maybe we don't do them perfectly. Maybe we don't do them with excellence. Maybe we still need to get better at them. But there are some things that we all naturally do well, that we are gifted at doing, that we are more than capable of doing. But on the flip side, there are some things that we don't do so well, right? It goes without saying that the things we don't do very well are not our natural abilities. For example, it's always helpful to give an illustration, isn't it? For example, a lot of you already know this about me, but my natural ability is not singing. It is not singing. As the old saying goes, I can't carry a tune in a bucket. I have never been able to sing for as long as I can recall. In fact, earlier this week as I was working on the sermon, I was reminded of something that happened to me when I was a kid. Uh, the church that I was a part of growing up in Fort Lauderdale, Christ Church United Methodist. Well, when I was a kid, they had a children's choir. And I was a part of that children's choir, so was my brother. And every single spring the children's choir would put on a musical for the entire church to come to. So when I was 10 years old, and in the fifth grade, the musical that we were doing that year was based on the story of Jonah. Remember the story of Jonah? If you're not familiar with that story, uh, Jonah is about this uh, messenger. Uh, the story of Jonah is about this messenger whose name is Jonah. He's a prophet. And God tells him to go to the city of Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, because the people of Nineveh had been corrupt and evil, and God wanted to destroy them because of their wicked ways. Jonah had zero desire to go to Nineveh because he was an Israelite, and the people of Israel were enemies of the people of Nineveh. So instead of listening to God, what did he do? He got on a ship, headed in the opposite direction. Do you remember where he went or tried to go? Tarshish, in what today would be Spain, complete opposite direction. But then on the way to Tarshish, suddenly God sent the storm upon the sea. The storm was so bad, it threatened to break the ship apart. The sailors came to find out that the reason for the storm was Jonah was running away from God, or trying to run away from God. It's impossible to run away from God. And so the sailors took Jonah at his insistence, tossed him overboard, but before Jonah drowned, this gray fish came, swallowed him up. He was in the belly of the fish for three days, three nights, before the fish spits him onto dry land. Actually, in the Hebrew, it's a little more literal. The fish vomited him onto dry ground. And so we were doing a musical based on that story. Sounds really awesome, doesn't it? So I really wanted the part of Jonah. I daydreamed about being Jonah. I memorized all the words. I just kept thinking about it. But when it came to casting, I didn't get the part of Jonah. You could say, aw. That wasn't forced, was it? <laughs> but I did get a part. I got the part of the captain of the ship. Not the part of Jonah, but still not that bad of a part. Well, there was a song that I was supposed to sing that went along with this part of the story. In fact, I still remember the song. I'm not going to sing it, don't worry. <laughs> so here I am at one of the rehearsals, and I'm singing this song in front of the children's choir director, and she just stops me and she says, Chris, you have a wonderful speaking voice. I think it might be better, instead of singing the song, if you would say the lyrics instead. Now, I was 10 years old in the fifth grade. I really wasn't that aware. I didn't know any better. So singing, saying the lyrics didn't make much of a difference to me. So I said, okay. But as an adult, I look back on that situation and I realized that she didn't have the heart to tell me that I was not a good singer. What was she going to say? I was 10 years old. And in the fifth grade, she didn't want to hurt my feelings. No wonder I didn't get the part of Jonah. I should not have gotten the part of Jonah because Jonah had far more of a uh, singing part than the captain of the ship did. 
Singing is not my natural ability. And don't worry, you don't have to feel sorry about me or for me because I've come to terms with this over the years, okay? Uh, my therapist and I, we've worked this out. Actually, <laughs> singing is not my natural ability. I'm okay with this. But there are some of you here today, like the people in our choir, amen? You all are gifted singers. Or there are some people, and you are gifted at playing a musical instrument, like the piano or the organ. There are some of you, like Hannah King in the back, and you are great at making graphics and videos. There are some of you who have the amazing ability to make people laugh. People just crack up when they listen to you. There are some of you, and you are incredibly handy, and you can fix things up in a moment's notice. The point is, all of us have natural abilities. All of us have natural abilities, and the church needs our natural abilities. But the church does not simply need our natural abilities. The church also needs something else that falls in the realm of talent that Paul speaks about in 1 Corinthians 12. And that would be the church needs our spiritual gifts. Can you say this with me? Spiritual gifts. Listen again with me to what Paul says here in this text. This is verses 4 through 6 of 1 Corinthians 12. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of services, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. Paul here is talking about spiritual gifts. And sometimes we confuse spiritual gifts and natural abilities. Spiritual gifts and natural abilities do share some things in common. They're both given to us by God. But categorically, the two of them are different. God gives all people natural abilities at birth. God gives all people natural abilities at birth. But God gives spiritual gifts specifically to Christ's followers at their rebirth. at their rebirth. Spiritual gifts are not natural abilities. They're supernatural abilities. And God gives them to us, not for our sake, but for the sake of the church, so that the entire body of Jesus might be built up in this world. Now, the New Testament talks a lot about spiritual gifts. Peter talks about them a little bit. I believe it's in 1 Peter. But the one who really talks about them a lot is Paul, uh, the writer that we've been referring to. He talks about them in 1 Corinthians 12, the passage that we've been looking at. He also talks about them in Romans 12. He talks about them in Ephesians 4, the passage that we looked at at the beginning of the sermon. And he offers different examples. Do you remember some of the examples that he gives? Prophecy. What are some other examples? Wisdom, shepherding, healing, speaking in tongues, interpreting what's being spoken in tongues. Again, unlike natural abilities, we haven't always had our spiritual gifts. But God gives them to us for the sole purpose of enriching the church. I think I've shared in the past that my mom, Judy, one of the saints who has gone on to join the great cloud of witnesses, uh, she passed away back in 2015. My mom was a person of deep and profound faith that had an incredible impact on me as a child and also as an adult. And my mom oftentimes would feel led to pray for somebody without even knowing why she was praying for that person in the first place. And so I remember when I was about 12 or 13 years old, I woke up in the morning and I went to the back of the house and my mom, she was on her knees and she was praying. It wasn't that unusual. She would often wake up and go on her knees and pray and so later that morning at breakfast, she and I were talking, and she was drinking her coffee, and she said to me, Christopher, my mom always called me Christopher, never called me Chris, not even once. She said, Christopher, when I woke up this morning, I really felt led to pray for Joanne. Joanne was a friend of my mom. She was a part of my mom's small group at the church. They called them Wesley Fellowship Groups. And when my mom said that to me, I really didn't think that much of it. Okay, you felt led to pray for Joanne. That's, that's very nice. Later that morning, my mom was running some errands with my sister, and the phone rang, and I answered it. And it was my mom's friend, Barbara. And she said, is your mom there? And I said, no, can I take a message? Do you remember taking messages for people? We don't do that very much nowadays. And she said, please have your mom call me as soon as she gets home. 
Evidently, Joanne was taken by ambulance to the hospital early this morning. And the time that she was taken to the hospital was the exact same time my mom felt led to get out of bed and to pray for her without even knowing why she was praying for her because Joanne was seemingly healthy. Even now as I share this story, I get goosebumps. My mom had the spiritual gift of faith. God gave her a remarkable faith and that led her to have a special kind of prayer life with God. There are some of you here today who, like my mom, you have the spiritual gift of faith. And there are some of you, you have other spiritual gifts. All of us have a spiritual gift if we're followers of Jesus. In fact, uh, my friend Irwin Lopez, a colleague of mine, uh, he preached here not too long ago. Uh, he's a clergy person. He serves as the director of Central Florida Wesley, which is affiliated with uh, UCF as well as with Valencia College. Well, Irwin shared with me that when he was in high school, this older woman came up to him and said to him, young man, one day you're going to be a pastor. I can just see it. Irwin thought that she was nuts because at that time he wasn't even going to church. Didn't consider himself a Christian. Clearly she had the spiritual gift of prophecy. Just like all of us have natural abilities, all of us who are followers of Jesus, who are disciples of Jesus, we've given our lives over to Jesus, we have, by the power of the Holy Spirit, this is not something that we've come up with in ourselves, we have, by the power of the Holy Spirit, spiritual gifts. And if you're sitting in your chair this morning, in your pew, and you're wondering what your spiritual gifts are, well, the encouraging news is that our denomination, the United Methodist Church, has an online spiritual gifts inventory or assessment that you can take. Wouldn't that be awesome if you were to go home today, take that assessment, and find out what your spiritual gifts are? Uh, this is up here in the monitor. It's also in the sermon notes section of the bulletin. I do encourage you at some point today or this week, find out what your spiritual gifts are. What happens when all of us who are followers of Jesus, when we take our spiritual gifts and our natural abilities, and we allow God to use them in conjunction with, in cooperation with, the natural abilities and the spiritual gifts of other people, well, then the ministry of Jesus goes forward in this world. I refer again to the Apostle Paul who says this in verse 12 of chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. For just as the body is one and as many members and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with who? So it is with Christ. Now, that's kind of strange. We would expect Paul to say in this text, so it is with the church. Because remember in this passage, Paul gives us his ecclesiology, his understanding, his conception of the church. He doesn't say so it is with the church. And that's the reason I chose to go with this translation, because this translation, the NRSV, is most faithful to the Greek. He quite literally says, so it is with Christ. So it is with Christ. You see, for Paul, Christ and the church are inseparable. So oftentimes nowadays, we want to separate Jesus from the church, but for Paul, Christ and the church are inseparable. You know where Paul got this idea from? He actually got it from Jesus himself. Do you remember his story? Back when he was known as Saul, Paul was a persecutor of Christians, and in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 9, we're told that he was on his way to Damascus to terrorize Christians who were living there, arrest them, take them back to Jerusalem so that they could suffer the consequences of following Jesus. But then on his way to Damascus, what happened? Suddenly he was met by none other than Jesus Christ himself. Listen with me to these words from Acts 9, verses 3 through 5. It says, As he, Saul, was approaching Damascus on this mission. How interesting, by the way, that the writer, Luke, uses the word mission, and, but he doesn't use it in reference to Christian mission, he uses it in reference to people being terrorized. Uh, but of course, later on, Paul would come to change that mission as he became a Christian himself. But as he was approaching Damascus on this mission to terrorize people, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, sometime to really get somebody to pay attention, you have to say their name twice. Spouses, am I right? You gotta say somebody's name twice. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord, Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now think about this comment. At this point in the story, 
Some of you know that the book of Acts is part two to Luke's gospel. Well, at this point in the story, Jesus is already resurrected. He's already ascended back to God the Father in heaven. Saul isn't technically persecuting Jesus, at least not literally. Instead, who's he persecuting? The church, Jesus' followers. But by persecuting the church, Saul was, in fact, persecuting Jesus. Why? Because Christ and the church are inseparable. Christ and the church are inseparable. That's what it means to say that we are the body of Jesus, that when people persecute us, they're persecuting Jesus. And on the flip side, when people receive our ministry, they're receiving the ministry of Jesus. When people encounter us, when people meet us, they are encountering and meeting Jesus Christ himself. Folks, are we grasping? Are we wrapping our brains around the significance of this, the awe of this, the wonder of this? All of us have a part to play in the work of Jesus. So let me ask you this question. How are you allowing God to use your talent, your natural abilities and spiritual gifts to be in ministry with us at Asbury? Are you allowing God to use your talent, your natural abilities and spiritual gifts to be in ministry with us at Asbury. Maybe you've heard the joke before that in far too many churches like Asbury, 90% of the work is done by 10% of the people. You ever heard that one? 90% of the work is done by 10% of the people. Let's allow God to change that as we close out 2022 and we enter 2023. Instead of being a community where some people do everything, by grace, let's become a community where everybody does something, where everybody uses their God-given talent to share in the ministry of Jesus Christ in this world. John Orberg, who's a pastor and an author, um, he shares that he had a grandmother, a maternal grandmother, who has since passed away. Her name was Florence. Florence. Well, when Florence was a little girl, She was gifted by her parents with this small set of blue china dishes. And then on every special occasion like Christmas or uh, confirmation or graduation or a birthday, she would be given another piece to add to the collection. And so she would take that piece and she would wrap it up and she'd put it in a box. Each piece was so expensive that typically people couldn't afford more than one at a time. But then by the time she was an adult, she had an entire set. Well, she kept that set wrapped up in a box, and it seemed as if it should only ever be used for a really special occasion. Did the special occasion ever come? No, not even once. Instead, those china dishes stayed carefully wrapped in a box until everybody forgot about them. Even Florence forgot about them. And then she passed away. Well, one day her husband was up in the attic, and he was going through some boxes, and he came across that box, and he opened it up, He was just about to throw it away, but then he called Ortberg's mom, his daughter-in-law, on the phone, and he said, I was going through some of Florence's things, and I came across this box of china dishes. I noticed that they're blue, which is your favorite color. Would you like to have them? If not, I'm just going to donate them to the Salvation Army. Ortberg says that here his grandmother had received this amazing gift but she never, ever got to enjoy it. It's pretty sad. But what's even sadder, what's even more unfortunate, is when God gives all of us talent, natural abilities, and spiritual gifts, and we don't ever use them to contribute to the ministry of Jesus. Folks, ministry is not simply the work of the pastor. Ministry is the work of everybody, all God's people. Instead of being a community where some people do everything, By grace, let's become the community where everybody does something, where everybody uses their God-given talent, their God-inspired talent, to share in the ministry of Jesus Christ in this world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.